good morning, M1. If you're happy to be in the house of the Lord, say amen. Praise God. Love it. All right. We are glad you're here today. We are at Alabaster Sunday. So just a few quick announcements. Um, next Saturday, Saturday February 11th, um, we, the teens will be having snow tubing night at Perfect North Slopes. Perfect. All right. Um, that is in Lawrenceburg. Um, they will be leaving at 3 o'clock and returning by 9.30. Cost is $25 a person. Um, for more info or to sign up, see Pastor Josh. Next week, we have Super Sunday, February 12th. Um, we are going to have food, friends, fellowship. So, and by food, I mean we're going to have some good soup for Super Sunday. Um, and if you have not been here on Super Sunday, that soup is delightful. So come prepared, um, invite somebody, and we will just enjoy time together and get some fellowship and food. In two weeks, we will have the annual M1 church elections. All M1 members are invited to vote from 8.30 to 9 and 10 minutes following the worship service voting in the boardroom. Um, so we will be voting on our new board, the leadership of our church. Um, so if you are a member, make sure that we are here. We do want to make sure you're praying in the meantime. Um, we, we want the right people um, leading our church and leading the way he leads us. So that is in two weeks. In three weeks, we will click, kick off our new life group class. The, we will be doing the case for Easter. Um, so we will be doing that for four Sundays, the 26th, the 5th, the 12th, and the 26th again. Um, from 4.30 to 6, We will. the sign-up sheet is at the info desk. Do you know where we're going to meet yet? Okay. Be meeting in the East Wing, probably, according to the guy running it. So. Um, also, Coming in March, we are going to be having our spring revival with Michael Perkins. Um, so we are going to be doing that March 31st through April 2nd. Okay, I know I had that wrong last week. So um, financial support envelopes are at the back. We want to um, just bless Mike for coming and sharing time with us, time away from his family. Um, so if you feel called, feel need, or want to give and support that, there are envelopes back at the sign-up desk. Last thing, we, it is Alabaster, so I am handing it over to Pastor Jeff so we can take care of that. Thank you, Levi. If you're happy and you know it, say amen. Welcome to Alabaster Sunday, and we are going to have the Alabaster March in just a few moments. So uh, how many were here last Sunday? And you saw the different ways uh, to give, the little video. So. Uh, what we're going to do after I pray, uh, we're going to have everyone stand, come to the middle aisle, come down and put your uh, uh, offering in the little uh, cardboard alabaster church, if we can get it open. Okay, now, I am doing mine envelope style. I got my $6.13 here, so I'm just going to drop it in there like that, Okay. Levi is going to come, and he's going to show us how to do it dump, dump truck style, because he said that was his favorite from last week. So here's the dump truck style. All right. Oh, maybe. Don't try this at home. <laughs> okay. And then Mike's going to come and do freestyle. Uh, he said something about a tractor and a grater, but I'm not a farmer, so I don't know what a tractor grater is. Here he goes. Oh. I think it's ballet style. <laughs> there you go. All right. Good job, Michael. All right. All right. However you do it, uh, uh, as long as you give something. And, and some of you may say, well, I didn't come prepared today. Anything you give at all will go to missions to help build buildings around the world to share the good news of Jesus Christ. So if you will stand and prepare, we'll, uh, the flow is to come into the middle aisle, come forward, and then exit 
uh, on the outside so that we can kind of do a circular flow. But let's pray for it, and then the praise team is going to sing a song as we give. But let's just give it to the glory of the Lord. Father, thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you for all of our missionaries uh, literally around the world sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. And we pray that you'll encourage them, inspire them, and let this offering be used to build churches and hospitals and schools and clinics so that people can know you love them and that the Church of the Nazarene loves them. Bless this offering and multiply it for the great kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray, and everyone said, Amen. if you will, come to the middle aisle and come forward and praise team, sing away.
Church of God headquarters Anderson, Indiana, and eventually became a Nazarene, and so you can tell that I never learned how to dance. <laughs> we were talking uh, before rehearsal this morning, and I think Crystal said that the one that was her favorite last week was the one about the guy dancing, and so, uh, well, okay, we'll give that a try. Well, as you can see, it wasn't too good, but we got it in there. Thank you, thank you, church, uh, for the for your contribution. Um, you know, sometimes we wonder how how can we make a difference in our world? How can we uh, touch the lives of others when we live in Anderson, Indiana, or Martinsville, Indiana? How can we do that? But today, you have touched the lives of people around the world because of your willingness to give. And we're, we're grateful. Um, and, and it's going to be amazing, I'm sure, to see how God takes what we've done and expands that because, you know, he's capable of doing that. And, and lives are going to be touched and, and hearts are going to be changed and it's just absolutely going to be an amazing thing for us to see. I don't know about you, uh, but I, I have to say that I've been guilty of this myself. Um, sometimes we hear folks talking about modern worship today, and I've made the comment, and you probably have too, that, boy, I just don't like that music where you got seven words and you sing it 11 times. You ever done that? Over and over and over again. I want to tell you something. You may not know this, but you're going to find out. There is a chapter in the Bible where the same line, same words, are repeated 26 times. One time in every single verse. You ready? Psalm 136, 1 through 3. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His love endures forever. And then it goes on and continues. His love endures forever. Do you know how long forever is? Forever and forever and forever, God's love continues and endures to us. Are you grateful for that this morning? I am. I am thrilled to death to know that God loves this little peon farmer. And loves him so much that he sent his only son to the cross to die for me and for you. And I'm so grateful for that this morning. His love endures forever. We're going to sing some songs this morning that simply talk about love and God's power and His goodness. And we're going to invite you to stand with us. And we want you to sing your, sing your hearts out today. Let's worship and praise our God because remember, I repeat it, His love endures forever. Let's sing.
Yeah. 
Gracious Heavenly Father, we do think the music this morning has been a sweet, sweet sound in your ears. We thank you for hearing our prayer, for hearing our call, for hearing our cries. You're such a great and mighty God. And we are thankful today that your love endures forever. No situation, no difficulty, no struggle is too much for you to handle in our lives. And you know where each and every person out the week they've had, you know, this morning. And we simply ask that you will come and touch us. And we ask your anointing and blessing upon uh, Pastor Josh as he brings the message. Let us hear from your heart through his voice. Let us know that we've been in your presence. You know the needs represented here today. And we know that you're more than able to meet every one. So let us hear your voice. Just thank you for being our God, our great and mighty God who loves us. In Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, you may be seated. Before Pastor Josh comes up, I just wanted to thank, uh, say congratulations to Steve and uh, Nyla Crosley. 45 years they've been married. So congratulations. And that officially makes Nyla a saint. to be in the house of the Lord, that's for sure. I actually had some trouble this week um, trying to figure out what God wanted me to speak on. Thursday, I was thinking about it, and I was really concentrating, and um, I was at work, and I was just thinking to myself, what am I going to preach on? And God said to me, or I heard a voice, not an actual voice, but something that popped up in my head, tent makers. Now, how many of you have study the tent makers in the Bible. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so when I when that came up, I was like, God, what in the world? Like, I've never even thought of the tent makers. Why, why, why do you want me to teach on that or talk about that? And I was like, oh, okay, maybe I should spend more time about the tent makers. And it was really interesting. And so starting off with learning what tent makers actually do, I looked into it and I found out that they make canvases. And they usually use camels or goats to do that. And it's a large ordeal to do. And then I was thinking about that. I was like, oh, okay, that's cool. And I, I found the passage that I was going to speak on. And I started looking more into tent makers and things like that. And I was like, tent makers uh, in the church. Or, and I, I came across some fun fact. And I thought that... This is a sign that it, this message was ordained by God. This is what he wants me to speak on and preach about. Because tent makers are also referred in the modern church to those who are missionaries who go overseas and hold another occupation so that they can preach the gospel to others. And I was like, oh my goodness, on Alabaster Sunday, this is right. This is what God wants us to speak me to tell you about. And so that's where we're going to spend our time. If you want to, you can go ahead and turn into Acts chapter 18. We are going to be in 18 during the most part of it. Um, and today we're going to look at the three tent makers. Now one you may be very familiar with because he has written most of the New Testament that we see. He writes so many letters and um, it's actually Paul. And so I thought to myself, why is Paul a tent maker? And then I got to looking at why he w held an occupation. And well, number one, it was good to get to know people in the surrounding area. Number two, I don't know if you know this, but traveling was expensive. And back in that day, it was expensive to even send letters. I read at one point that it cost m approximately around $2,000 nowadays money to send a, a letter as far as Paul sent. And I thought to myself, my goodness, <laughs> I don't know about you, but I am so glad we have texting right now and the email. <laughs> if we, could you imagine having to spend $2,000 every time you wanted to talk to someone? But that shows the importance of all the letters that he wrote and how passionate and important he thought each and every single word he put in those letters were. So today we're going to look at the three tent makers. Paul is one of them, and then we'll see the other two 
But Acts chapter 18 is where we're starting. And we're going to go ahead and start off with verse 1. And we're going to go through verse 4 to start off with. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila and a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them. And because he was a tent maker, as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath, he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. So there we have our three tent makers. Paul, Aquila, and Priscilla. Now, I don't know if you knew this, but I didn't really, I haven't really looked much into Aquila and Priscilla. But as I started looking into them, I was like, oh my goodness, I have been slacking. These people are wonderful. Excuse me. And so I, I was just so excited about this. But we're going to first start off with Paul. We're going to start off with something you may be familiar with, right? So here we have Paul, right? And he is working. He has a J job. He clocks in from, I don't know, 9 to 5 every day, I, I would say, maybe longer. Uh, Monday through uh, Friday, right? And then he would go to the synagogues and then tell them about Christ. So he was like an average Joe at this point, right? And I, I found this interesting because there was also kind of, he kind of struggled. He kind of got in the rut of things. And I, I've been there myself where you just, you, you put your head down and you get the work done and you just, okay, I have to meet this and this and this task by the end of the week and I'm going to accomplish that. And I feel like Paul at this point was, was in that rut, kind of in that mindset where, okay, I got to do this, I got to do this, and of course I got to go to the synagogue and tell them about God. Um, I got to tell them about Christ, and, and, and hopefully I'll get some converts. But I can kind of see that Paul was in a rut here because it, it just says, like, he did this for a while. It was basically the same thing. Now, I don't know if you have been in that way before, but I have. And, and, and let me tell you, it's really hard to get out of rut. <laughs> How many of you have ever had a vehicle stuck before? Ooh, yeah, that is not fun, is it? No. <laughs> oh, my goodness. There is, I, I, thankfully, I myself have never been stuck. I have been a excellent driver, a star, best person. I'm just joking. I, <laughs> I've had my faults too. But I have never been stuck in a rut. But I have seen people who have, and I'm like, oh my goodness. And I've actually helped a couple people who were stuck in a rut. Um, <laughs> well, Rob's probably preaching, so he won't, he won't hear this. But Rob himself got stuck in a rut in his backyard at his house in Kentucky. <laughs> and it was funny because of course, I was there helping him move something. I think that day, it may have been a big screen TV. I, I can't remember. But him and I, we like to joke and say we were pastors, but we also had a moving company. And it was always moving furniture, whether it be the church's, his furniture, or my furniture, or someone else's in the church. We basically had a moving company. We moved stuff all the time. But <laughs> so his backyard, he, he went through the back gate, and it, the ground was still damp and wet. Um, it hadn't rained for a while, but it's just kind of, in that area, it, it had a lot of clay. So he started backing up. <laughs> Ooh, the back of that truck went like that, sliding all over the place. And then, then finally it got stuck in one spot, and we were trying to, to push him out of it, and, and the wheel starts turning, and, you know, it starts to make a rut. Well, once you get in a rut, it's very hard to get out, Right. Uh, you can push, you can, and especially with that clay, like, holding onto the tire, it becomes difficult to get out. Thankfully, finally, we were able to get it out uh, through his redneck engineering uh, and my just going along with <laughs> whatever he said method. Uh, we were able to get it out. But sometimes we get in a rut and we find ourselves stuck and we, and, and, and we just like to spin the tire and spin the tire and sometimes we don't even realize it. We were just doing the same thing over and over again. See, 
God has called us to do more, to be more. And sometimes we forget that and we start thinking to ourselves, well, this is my life and this is how it is. Let me tell you today, God has called you to be more. He has called you to do more. And when you are trusting in God and following his path, listen, he may do some redneck engineering with your life or he may do some brain science, astronaut rocket engineering. I don't know what he does, but he does whatever he needs to help you get out of that rut, to help you move with your life, to be more impactful to those around you. Now, I will confess that I have recently been stuck in a rut at work. See, they, they put me back in my corner, and I told you that I've told, talked about this in a while, for a while now. But they put me back in the corner. And I use that as an excuse to, well, I can't really communicate with people. I can't interact with people. I'm stuck back here. And that was the devil. I'm going to be honest. It was the devil saying, you're back here. Nobody wants to talk to you. Just put your head down, do your work, and clock out. And recently, I have been moved back to the general population, as I like to say. They have moved me out of the corner. But I find myself still struggling with that, that mindset of being in the rut, being by myself. And, and there are days when I just put my head down and just want to do my work. And, and this week has been really challenging because there's this lovely gentleman. And bless his heart. His, he loves to talk. He's got the gift of gab. And when he's not gabbing, he's humming, he's singing. And, 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 it, <laughs> and it was early in the morning, and he was asking me questions and talking, and I was thinking to myself, I just want to get my work done. I am not even awake. Wait until I get some coffee or after breakfast. But as I was thinking later in the day, I was like, you know what? That's the wrong mindset to have. I mean, here is a gentleman, and I don't know if he's saved or not, but I had an opportunity to talk to him. And I missed it to interact. Yeah, I wasn't rude, and, and I gave answers when he asked, and I talked a little bit with him, but I wasn't enthusiastic about that conversation. I, I, I was like, I just, I'm going to get my work done. I've got a meeting here in a little bit. I want to get as much as I can. I want to get this box done by the end of the day. And I was trying to focus on him instead of communicating with him. Well, actually, Thursday, uh, no, it was Friday. Friday, he was actually sitting in a desk diagonal from me, and he was humming and singing. And, and <laughs> he, he caught, I looked at him, and he said, sorry, I, I, I don't mean to disturb you. I told him, I said, listen, bud, I love it when you hum. I love it when you sing. I said, it, it, it's, you're joyful about it, and that, that, makes, that makes the day so much better. And it's true. When we have that interaction with people, when we see other people like that and say, listen, it's not about me. It's not about getting stuck doing what I normally do over and over again, but maybe it's about stepping out a little bit. Maybe it's a small step. Maybe it's a big step. But we have to be careful not to get in a rut. So the first thing, first point I want to point out, I'm, I'm, I know, you're like, oh, we're just now getting to the first point? <laughs> We focus on the wrong things. We do. We tend to focus on the wrong things a lot. We focus on where we have to be, how we have to do things, uh, what, what, it's, it's shameful to say this, but sometimes we even use children as an excuse. Well, we have to do this so that they have a great life or, or so that they, they can have fun, so that they have friends later on. But when in reality, what we are missing is we're missing the opportunity to spend time with them with Christ. And that's the children, but also for ourselves and our friends, where we just say, okay, I'm just, I, you know what? I've got to do this, this, this mission or this task. I don't have time. So here we have Paul kind of doing the same thing over and over again, right? But here, there was a change in his life. Something came and changed things around for him. And got him out of the rut. It was actually friends. And so we're continuing on with uh, verse 5. It says, When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. 
But when they opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and and said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent of it. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Then Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of Titus Justice, a worshiper of God. And Crispus, the synagogue leader, and his entire household believed in the Lord. And many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. Okay, so I really want to clarify something because I'm not even joking. My brain, I don't know if I was dead when I was reading this or not. But when I read verse 6, I was really confused. It said, but when, Paul, when they opposed Paul and became abusive, I was thinking, oh my gosh, Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia and they were abusive to their friend Paul? No, no, no. It was the Jews in the area. <laughs> and, I, and I was like, and I, I'm not even joking. I spent like a good 45 minutes looking up and looking at the commentary, looking on Google, and asking, why was Silas and Timothy abusive to Paul? No, <laughs> they, they weren't. Um, but the Jews were. And see, he became exclusively preaching to the Jews. Now, obviously, they did not want to hear the message. Obviously, they had trouble with the message. But here we have Paul going, kind of, he's, he's elevated his ministry, right? He's preaching every single day. He's saying, you know what, I'm going to tell them about Christ, whether they want to or not. See, he started to stir up trouble. And still the Jews, the leaders in the synagogue were like, no, we don't want to hear this anymore. And they became abu abusive to Paul. <laughs> and then we see Paul saying, you know what? Your blood is on your own head. Right? And we actually see this as kind of a, a rephrasing or a different way of saying it, of how Jesus said, if they rebuke you and, and do not want you in their town, dust off your cloak and your shoes and go to another town, right? And so Paul is saying, you know what? You Jews, you don't want to hear this message. I'm going to the Gentiles. Maybe I can get somewhere with them, right? And so then Paul left the synagogue and went to, the, to see Titus Justice, right? Now, Titus Justice was actually a Gentile, but he believed in God. And, and see, Paul was like, you know what? I'm going to talk to this godly man, and I'm going to, to tell him and everybody who's around him about God. And because of that, we see that many Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized that day. See, sometimes we get focused and we think, okay, this is what I'm supposed to do. Even in our church, even as a church, we get focused and think, this is our mission, this is our task, this is how we are supposed to be. And we, we like to sit there because it's comfortable. But sometimes there's change that needs to be because sometimes we are ministering to these Jews, to these people who say, I don't want to hear your message anymore. And so because of that, we, we need to refocus and say, okay, we're going to go to people who do. We're going to be able to spread the gospel to anybody who's willing to listen. And nothing's going to stop us. See, Paul even faced abuse, but he said, you know what? I'm going to preach to the Jews as much as I can, but when they, when they stop listening, I'm going to move to someone else. I'm going to talk to someone else. Sometimes when, our, when, when you minister to someone, not everybody's going to become a Christian. It's just a fact, right? But we cannot let that get to us. Because we, maybe, we're just the person who's planting the seed. Maybe we're just starting their journey or whispers in their ear to start their journey with Christ. Just because they don't accept Christ with us doesn't mean that God doesn't have a plan to redeem them later. So we can't get hung up on that. But we also can't just focus on a group of people and say, this is our group. No, we need to focus on all people, right? And this is what Paul finally does. He says, you know what? I, I've been with these Jews for way too long. I am going to spend some time with the Gentiles who I have missed the opportunity to minister to. And so he does that. And because of that, many believed and were baptized. See, I, I find it interesting because there are some, in some commentaries they say that Priscilla, Priscilla was actually a Gentile. And she was married to her husband, Aquila, who was a Jew. Right? I don't know if you know about Jewish customs, but that was pretty much a no-no. That was also a no-no <laughs> within uh, the citizens, citizens in Rome. Right? We see in the first reading of verses 1 through 4 that they actually had to leave their home country 
because in Rome, they, they made a decree that all Jews left. Now, Priscilla could have used that as an excuse and said, you know what, all my family, all my friends are here in Italy. I'm going to stay here with them. No, she chose to leave with her husband. And they left and did a ministry. But here we have Paul. He is working alongside a Jew and a Gentile, yet he first focused on the Jew in the synagogue. He started there. I wonder to myself how Priscilla felt at that moment. She was a believer. But I wonder if what she thought about the other Gentiles in the area, about how, how they are being ministered to. See, Priscilla, she actually becomes an elevated position socially. And I think during this time that she was actually starting her ministry. And we'll get into that a little bit. But when we minister to people, we need to make sure we're not excluding anybody. That we're focusing on everyone. That even those who are considered outcasts, those who are considered unreligious in our day, we need to be, be able to reach them. But Josh... <laughs> They're crazy sometimes. I know. Listen, I know that sometimes when people have such strong beliefs and are so vocal about it, that it can be hard to approach them. But I do also know that they do need to be approached so that they have a chance to hear God's message. Which can be challenging. Right? That's our second point. It can be challenging. We see this with Paul. He was challenged over and over again. Yet he still chose to stay. Acts chapter, or verses 9 through 11, it says this. One night, the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you. And no one is going to attack and harm you. Because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half, teaching them the word of God. See, I don't know. See, what was custom was come into a new town, speak the gospel, tell them about Christ, get them founded, and then leave. But here we have Paul staying in a long, for a long time in the city, right? And it, at this point, when, when God speaks to him, it would have been the point where he would have normally left for a different city. Excuse me. But Paul is told, stay. Stay, for I have so many people in this city. But I also have a purpose for you to stay. Sometimes when God tells us to stay in, this, in the, the boiling pot, it may be difficult. Trust me, I know. When you are in an awkward situation, you just want to leave, Right? So, uh, I'll share this. It's recorded, so he'll be able to listen to it when he's older. I was spending the night with Carter. And he had a little accident. And he brought it in to me and said, Josh, I need you to change my diaper. I don't know if you know this, I have no kids, right? <laughs> I have cats. They have cat boxes, super easy to take care of. I don't even have to let them out. They just go. Oh, my. <laughs> so I empty it out in the toilet. Flush. It doesn't go down. I was like, Lord, I do not even want to be in this situation. <laughs> I don't want to do this. And I go, oh, Carter, what are we going to do? It, it's stuck. <laughs> he says, you can reach in and get it. <laughs> I said, Carter, I'm not, I'm not, no. <laughs> I said, you don't have any other clue? He goes, 
maybe a net. <laughs> I don't know where he was going to get this net or not, but I was in a situation right then and there that I did not want to be in. But now looking back at it, I mean, that was so funny. His quick interaction of, of, of solutions that, listen, I was never going to do, but, <laughs> but his quick thoughts. And that moment where he trusted me enough to, to tell me he, was in a, he had a problem. Right? Sometimes we have to be in those situations where we're a little bit uncomfortable, where it's a little awkward, where maybe we're, we feel like we're surrounded by people who do not like us. But that is the moment where we're going to be able to connect most with those people, where we're going to be able to reach them where they are. Right? So I don't know if you know this, but those people who are living in sin— that are home right now, that are not trusting God, maybe they had a late night last night. Well, let me tell you. They're not hearing God, and they're not going to come to the decision, not unless God speaks to them or somebody comes into their life. They're not going to come to the decision that they need church, that they need Christ, right? They are living in sin. And so we need to be able to reach those people. And sometimes it is awkward. Sometimes it's going in places that we don't think that we really want to be in. But it needs to be done because we need to reach those people. There are so many people who are lost, who are being fed lies by social media, by media itself, by the news. And they don't have anybody telling them the truth. There are even going to be people, listen, there are going to be people on our journey of ministry that are, when we are telling people about Christ and about God, when we are doing the right thing, when we are in the place that God wants us to be, there are going to be people who challenge us. There are going to be people who, who may team up against us, who may say, you know what, you are not enough. I want you gone. I don't like you here. I don't like your messages. I don't like the love that you show. It makes me feel uncomfortable because that is something I've never had. Let me tell you today, God wants you there. And when God wants you there, he's going to make a way. I, I was working at a place, and cuss words, every single moment. And there were people who, who when somebody started talking about Christ, there were people who professed to be Christians that said, no, no, we can't talk about that. This is the workplace. And I was thinking to myself, you profess to be a Christian, yet this person who does not know God has asked me a question about God, and you want to put, stomp it and put a, put a stop to it, end it? No, this is the moment that has been opened up. But it took being in that uncomfortable position. There are going to be people who try to stop your ministry, stop what your message from God, but do not let them. Because God is on your side. It says here that, right? It says God says, do not worry. Do not be afraid, Paul. Yes, you may have had been abuse, an abusive situation from the Jews. Yes, they may have teamed up against you. Yes, they may have said, look at that man who's so awful, who's spitting blasphemy. They may have spread lies. But listen, Paul, they don't have God on their side. You do. Trust in me. Do not be afraid. (laughs) Oh, and I love this. This is the next part. Because when when, when Paul trusted in him, and listen, it took a year and a half for this to happen. So it didn't happen right away. That took a lot of faith and patience on Paul's part. But he trusted God enough and said, you know what, God, I'm trusting you. Here we have in in verses 12 through 17, this is (laughs) where, oh, I love this part. Because this is the part where we see God's plan being fulfilled. While Galileo, yes, it's the famous Galileo, if you were curious, was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews of Corinth made a united attack on Paul and brought him to the place of judgment. This man, they charged, is persuading the people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. Ooh, see, they were trying to get him in trouble by the law. Just as Paul was about to speak to Galileo, or speak, Galileo, Gal, ooh, 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 sorry. 
Galileo said to them, if you Jews were making a complaint about some misdemeanor or serious crime, it would be reasonable for me to listen to you. But since it involves questions about words and names and your own law, settle the matter yourselves. I will not be a judge of such things. So he drove them off. <laughs> Verse 17. Then the crowd there turned on Sosthenes, the synagogue leaders, and beat him in front of the proconsul. And Galileo showed no concern whatever. Oh, see, the Jews turned even on their own leader when, when it didn't go their way. They beat him up. And, and here's the interesting thing. I, either through Paul's ministry or Apollos, we'll see Apollos a little later. It is believed that Sosthenes is the same Sosthenes that was talked about later in the Bible, being a synagogue leader in Corinth that was a believer in Christ. I don't know if they beat some sense in him or not. <laughs> but <laughs> someone who were so opposed to Paul's message later became a believer. Like I said before, there may be some who are so opposed to you and your message of what Christ has done in your life, what Christ is doing. But God has a plan. And yes, it may be in a sticky situation when people bring you and, and say, oh, they've broken the law. Get rid of them. They are so against everything. Listen, Galileo was like, no, settle it amongst yourselves. God will protect you and guide you. We just have to trust in him and believe in him. I know. Listen, I know when those sticky situations come around, it's hard to stay there when God tells you to stay. I myself have wanted to flee, wanted to leave. I don't know if you know this about me, but I don't do awkward situations very well at all, really. I struggle with them. I'm like, oh, okay. Mm. I should probably. And usually it's because of self-doubt within myself, and, and God is really working on that within me. But I do understand for some, some of you may be put in an awkward situation or a difficult situation, and, and your first reaction is flee. It's human nature, right? Fight or flee. That's our responses. But sometimes God says, stay. Not fight, not flee. Stay. Be present. Speak love. Right? The third point, there are no small roles. Some of us get into the mindset that, oh, well, we are not, we are not the leader in the church. We are not on the board. We are not uh, a director of children's ministry. Uh, we're not a pastor. We're not staff. We're, so we're really, we're just small in the big scheme of God's plan. See, here's the thing. We are all, never a small role in God's plan. Because God has looked in each and every one of our lives and said, you are important. You are important. You have special skills. You have a special mindset that I have orchestrated and worked with you. And that, because of that, you will be able to reach a group of people that others won't. Some of us have doubted that before. Some of us said, well, God doesn't, can't use me. God doesn't want to use me. I am just an average Joe. I work nine to five. I, I I work, I come home, God can't use me, right? Paul was used, and here we're going to see Priscilla and Aquila used too. Verses 12 through 17, it says, or not 12, 24 through, it says this. Meanwhile, the Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough, I had trouble with that word, thorough, knowledge of the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately, though he knew only the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue when Priscilla and Aquila heard him. They invited him to their home and explained to him 
the way of God more out of you. See, it's been, it would be so easy for them to say, we're just average people. We just happened to hear him speak. We don't have anything to add. No, you do have something to add. They had something to add. See, it says Apollos didn't know anything. He only knew about the baptism of John. If they had heard his message and said, oh, okay, well, he knows enough to get by. It's good enough. Then they wouldn't have that opportunity to explain God deeper. Sometimes we need to realize that, that God has a special role for each and every one of us, that he has a task for you. Maybe it's explaining a small thing here and there. Maybe it's just being present when somebody's going through a crisis. Maybe it's just saying a kind word. I don't know. We all have been given the mission to love and go. Some of us forget that. And we say, well, God doesn't need me. No, he needs you to love. He needs you to love enough so that you can go and speak his message message to others. There are no small roles. I want you to get that out of your mindset. Because here, I'm going to tell you today that probably many of my teachers growing up thought what they were doing was just a small role in God's scheme, God's great big plan, right? But it wasn't. I remember my Sunday school teachers. I remember my children's church leaders. I remember my youth group leaders. I remember them all and the impact that they had on my life. I remember those friends that I have lost contact with that had a impact on my life when leading me to Christ and, and telling me about their experience. And see, they, they weren't in the mindset of, oh, I'm going to change Josh's life. No, they were just in the mindset of, God wants me to share my story. Sometimes God just wants you to share your story. Remember that because there are no small roles. Maybe because of your story that you share with someone, you may be able to, to help guide someone to be a pastor, a minister, a Sunday school teacher, someone who, has ha- who will have an impact on someone else's life. Your role is never small in God's plan. Now we're going to jump to Romans chapter 16, verses 3 through 5. It says, Greet, and this from, is from Paul again, okay? Greet Priscilla and Aquila, my co-workers in Christ Jesus. They risked their lives for me. Not only I, but all the churches, the Gentiles, are grateful to them. Greet also the church that meets at their house. See, and this is why I wanted to spend some time with talking about these tent makers, because here we have Priscilla and Aquila still doing God's mission, even without Paul. And see, <laughs> I love how Paul Paul says, greet Priscilla and Aquila, my co-workers in Christ Jesus. Because not only was he a co-worker with them during his day job, but they are co-workers together working on God's plan. See, and Paul doesn't just mention them there. He mentions them in several letters that he writes, and he says, greet Priscilla and Aquila. Anytime there was a letter that was either in Corinthians or, or in Rome, somewhere close by, he would say, greet them. See, here's the thing. There isn't much else said about Aquila and Priscilla. And we might think they are background characters in the, in the Bible. But they had such an impact on Paul and his walk with Christ that every time he got a chance, he said, I want to I want to greet them. I want to thank them for what they did. Because they showed love. Love to them, to Paul and to others. And they said, you know what? I don't care if my name is plastered 
everywhere. I don't care if I am later talked about what I'm going to do. Just tell others about Christ. I'm going to share the love that I have been exposed to by God. And I'm going to, I'm going to reach out. You know, those challenges that, that I face, the, the struggles that I have to help provide for those who, who are doing the ministry, you know, the struggles that I have to be persecuted, cast out, the fact that I had to leave my home country, that's, that's small in comparison to serving God and experiencing that love and, 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 and sh- re- showing it to others. See, Priscilla and Aquila, they saw it. They got it. And I hope you see it too, because here's the deal. We serve the same God. The same God who helped Paul out, who helped Priscilla and Aquila out, who showed them love, who who blessed their ministry so much so that they still had church meetings in their house. The same God that protected them as they traveled, protected them as they, they did their business and was able to minister others, to minister to others. That is the same God we serve. It's the same God who loves and cares for each and every one of us, who has said, you are not a small role in my plans. You are a great role in my plan. I have so much plan for your life. I have, <laughs> I have so much plan, ways to elevate you, to bless you, to encourage you. And listen, even when you are facing challenges, I will be by your side because you are not small in my eyes. You are great. If we look through the Bible and see and say, oh, okay, these people, they were given great tasks by God. They are supposed to be the main characters. Listen, if they went and thought to themselves, I am just a small role in God's plan. That would have limited what God could do with us. I don't want you to limit yourself. Because here's the deal. God's got great plans for you. Great ways that you can minister to those who are lost. I mean, we got a high school over there. We got several different schools throughout throughout the area of kids who need ministered to. We have parents who are living, who are struggling day in and day out to just survive, but they need ministered to. We have people who are stuck in the rut of sin and say, "This is enough. I've given up. I can't get out." They need ministered to. Do not think yourself as small. Many of us get in the mindset of of the Israelites when they were facing Goliath and they say, oh, we're small, we're small. He is too great. He's too powerful. He's too tall. And it took David, a small shepherd boy, to take down that giant. Listen, when you hear that you are small, it is the devil casting lies in your life and saying that you're not great enough. Listen, you serve the one true God, and he has said, I set your plans. I have set your path. I have set you to be a commander of my army, to be one who spread my gospel, the messenger of my words. Do not think yourself small. Be like Priscilla and Aquila, who said to themselves, listen, I am going to do God's plan. And no matter what, I am not going to think of myself small. So here, so here in a few minutes, we're going to actually have the praise team come and sing. And we're going to sing, sing a song that I think is very impactful, very important. And I, I, it, it, to me, it kind of sounds like an anthem. To realize that we serve the same God that has bestowed great roles on each and every one of us. And for us not to forget it. So praise team, please come and sing. If you would, let's all stand and sing. Same God.
Father, I pray that you help us to remember that you are the same God. That you are the same God who heals, who makes ways, who, who performs miracles. And dear Lord, I pray that 
that as we go into this world, let us be like tent makers. Let us be able to, even if we work a nine to five or work through the day, or maybe we're retired, maybe we go to school, whatever it may be. Dear Lord, let us remember that we are still called to love and go because there are many people who need to know that you are the same God who performs miracles, who loves and cares for them. So God, I pray that you help us to remember that, that you help us even in our own lives, maybe to maybe when we're struggling to embody that and remember that you are the same God. And remember that we are not small, that we have an important role in your kingdom. I pray that as we go out, that you bless this congregation, that you bless those who are watching at home. Let them know that they are in your kingdom. I pray this in your name. Amen. And you are dismissed. Thank you.